What is going on guys? Welcome to the Wednesday Night Live stream. I know it's been a couple weeks with the holidays and everything, so welcome back. We have good old Cruz from Elegance Girls on today. And what's going on, Cruz? Hi. Excellent. So I figured How's it going, Doug? I am wonderful, thank you. How are you doing, Cruz? Perfect. Excellent. Doing good. So yep. Doing good. Um, so I get asked a lot randomly, you know, should I go bigger tank? Should I go smaller tank? Like, there are, it all seems to be, if you never had a tank, for instance, yeah. it always seems to be one of those mm -hmm. questionable things, you know, do you go bigger or do you go small? So I figured that'd yep. be a good topic to dive into today. And there's two Absolutely. very, two very different kind of schools of thought on this one. Um, you know, the old school thought, which a lot of people say bigger is better. <laughs> so I'll go throw in the comments. So if you go mm -hmm. big, you have stability on your side. So a massive volume of water, it takes mm -hmm. a long, a lot longer for something to affect. Now on yep. the flip side, if something does go wrong, it takes a lot more to correct it. So it is definitely a trade off in that aspect. Yep, absolutely. Yes. I know. So, so in my past, <clears throat> I've done multiple size tanks for, for a lot of customers. We started off with, you know, the bio cubes, the, really, really teeny tiny ones, mm -hmm. the little nano tanks, the fish bowls. <laughs> and uh, those, those have a benefit, you know, for its mm -hmm. small size. And a lot of the times is uh, when you go and you encounter a problem, typically, you know, water change is the easiest way to do it, you know, mm -hmm. to rectify it, provided that you have good salt, you have good, uh, I want to say, uh, just an overall stable system, you know, mm -hmm. you have the macro algae that's also included in that little nano system mm -hmm. and you have a lot of the biologics in there, so on and so forth. But, um, yeah, uh, I've seen some of them go really, really, really wrong. <laughs> yeah. Where, where, where you decide to switch over to a new salt and that little bit of a water change, what we would consider little, you know, because, you know, you and I are playing in the hundred, 200 and 300 gallon tank systems. So like even a, I want to say a three gallon for a five gallon system or a 10 gallon system, the ratio is significant. So mm. you could destabilize a lot of things, um, you know, especially one of the ones being with the RO system, um, you know, you get a lot of the water, the RO water is devoid of a lot of oxygen, a lot mm -hmm. of gases, you know, it pushes a lot of the nasty stuff out of the water, which includes degassing of all the necessary uh, gases. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is, uh, yeah, you could actually uh, deplete your oxygen levels <laughs> rather I rapidly during a, <laughs> during a small water change, or I want to say, um, you know, a couple of gallons. And it would I've be never just considered to tip it over. I've never considered that one. It was a good one. Yeah. Um, okay, so one thing I want to touch on, you talked yeah. about changing salts. Now, mm -hmm. that's another question I get asked a lot. Like, it's surprising how many people ask how to change salt. Mm -hmm. um, providing, okay, so, I mean, slow is always steady. You don't need to magically take out all your water and magically replace it. I mean, there's no benefit mm -hmm. to doing that. You always want to go slow. So literally, just start using the new one and just doing your regular water changes. Now, I wouldn't be doing like a 50% water change. I'd be doing a little tiny weekly water change and slowly do it over time. So mm -hmm. no abrupt changes with salt, just slowly do it through your water changes. Yep. Now, now with the nano, I mean, right. large water change is relative. I know on my 20-gallon little red sea tank, I would do a mm -hmm. one bucket, so five-gallon water change. So it's 25%. And yep. just doing that one bucket water change literally is like the only thing I've done on that tank. Like it has a <laughs> doser. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I have slack on testing, so hopefully it's still good. But that one bucket of water change has kept the tank super happy. So in that aspect, mm -hmm. I think nanos are super duper easy. By the way, I like your background yeah. with the sharks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's awesome. Fish are mm -hmm. friends, not food. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless you're at a sushi but... restaurant, then it's questionable. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, anyways, um, you know, the flip side of uh, you know of a nano is that you know on the cons is yeah, any any quote unquote little change, you know, with some of the additives, some of the supplements, mm -hmm. you need to remember that you need to dilute it because mm -hmm. a lot of them are made for, I want to say 50 plus, mm -hmm. right? So the concentrations, you could actually dilute it and cut it in half to 50% strength in order to get that resolution for that smaller tank. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. So it makes it a little bit easier, even on the larger systems, if you want to take some of the pre-bottled stuff, mm -hmm. dilute it 50%. Now you actually have a little bit more pop-off water too, 
along with it. And then yep. you also have better resolution and controlling the levels from going too high, too fast, especially on some of these dosers. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, the smallest increment that you could do is 0.5. And then there's some that has even more graduates um, in between. But yeah. those dosers are very expensive. Yeah, well, even if you look at some like the cheap Jabo dosers, they're usually like one mm -hmm. mil, right? So, I mean... Yep, one mil. Dilute a half with water, now you know you're at a half a mil technically. You just got to remember Correct. that your are offset that you've done. So, Absolutely. And then, once again, if you want to do it even finer, you mm -hmm. cut that 50% solution in half again. Yeah, and there then, you go. And now you have a fourth step for one mil. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good way to cheat your doser a bit and get a little more granularity out of the cheaper doser. Absolutely. Good. So what do you think? Do you think yeah. it's easier to maintain a large volume of water or a small volume of water? Well, when you're first starting, and mm -hmm. I know that uh, this is also relative, when you're first starting and you're trying to get your hands wet into the salt, you know, into the salt water uh, scene, um, a lot of people would say, go big, mm -hmm. you know, you know, so that you have more stabilization. But once again, it's that the initial investment of salt alone is expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially the good quality salts, um, you know, you're talking about the Aquacraft, the Tropic Marins, you know, you have some Fritz, uh, uh, the mm -hmm. Fritz Pro, you have some of these other, you know, Aquaforest salts, they're not cheap. So if you're going to go big, you need to know what you're doing also. Mm -hmm. When you're mixing it up, you can't uh, super saturate the solution to above, you know, 1.026, 1.02, you know, 1.025 area. If you go above that, uh, one of the issues is is that um, if you're not pouring the entire bucket of salt into your system, um, things dissolve at a different rate. So at a super saturated solution, say, you know, just hypothetically 1.03 or something mm -hmm. like that, certain things don't dissolve into the water. And then you have a hyper solution or, yeah, a super saturated solution of, uh, you know, a lot of the the more soluble salts like potassium chloride, sodium, of course, sodium chloride, mm -hmm. magnesium chlorides, those want to dissolve faster. Mm -hmm. So, and then alkalinity, being that it takes a little bit longer for alkalinity to, to dissolve, once the water is already super saturated, the alkalinity does not want to go into solution at that point. Mm -hmm. So when you're putting in half a bucket, you're only getting the chlorides or the soluble salts and all the alkalinities behind okay. it. That's one of the things that I notice a lot of people doing is that they're not putting the entire salt bucket in, yeah. if that well, makes sense. Well, mm -hmm. most, a lot of people just mix five gallon bucket at a time, right? Or if you have a mm -hmm. brute 30 gallons, you know, where your container, yes. like two little fishies or yeah. some of them have their, yeah. their little packages, but most you Correct. buy a bucket or a box. Mm -hmm. So, so this if is you're a... gonna make up, yeah, if you're gonna make up the full five gallons of salt, Make sure that all the sediment on the inside as well gets poured into the system is what I'm trying to say. That way the alkalinity in your system has time to dissolve and your, you know, your DKH is also going to be balanced at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this is another good little subtopic actually. Mm -hmm. With, with yeah. salt, do you pre-mix mm -hmm. up your salt? Because um, technically yes. with different particles inside mm -hmm. of your salt mix, during shipping, mm -hmm. all that stuff, they could separate to different layers and levels in your bucket. So if you don't mm -hmm. mix it or shake it up, you might not be getting, the, you know, when the top the half might blend. have like less alkalinity and the bottom might have more. So there could be stuff like that yep. you're not necessarily getting from it. Correct. You get the stratification settling of the bigger particles or the heavier particles in, in there. The ones that have a little bit more water inside, like the magnesiums. Um, so yeah, you will get settling <laughs> mm -hmm. during sh shipping. Um, I typically make the full bucket. So I have a 200 gallon 200 gallon uh, storage tank. Nice. So I just pour in Lucky. the entire thing. <laughs> so whatever uh, whatever is left over in mm -hmm. the in the I want to call it the makeup water, I yep. typically drain off. You know, like if I have like about 10 gallons left, I usually utilize that as top off or something else, mm -hmm. and I keep it in buckets and I I slap a lid on it so that it won't evaporate. Okay. So that's another way to freaking save water. Mm -hmm. And then make a make a I want to call it a complete batch. Mm -hmm. That way, I know that it's completely mixed at the right levels that the that the manufacturer intended. Yep. No, that's fair. That's a good way to do it. If you have the space, yep. I mean, massive container yep. is the way to go. Mix it once, you're set yep. for the next couple months. Yep. Now, 
Now, if you're doing a small batch, okay, here's another random mm-hmm. question. You, this is probably relevant for you, but I saw a post today that I think I commented. I think it was today. They're asking about yeah. how you mix it. And, you know, some people are like, hand by a spoon, you know, use a power head in there. <laughs> I have a power head in mine now I before s- I have to turn pump. Yeah, I said that. 45 RPM. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, I thought that was you. 15 was degrees. Yeah. Yep. So you actually mix it with a spoon by hand. If you're in a 200 gallon <laughs> container, you got to have a pump no. in there. There's no way you're doing in that <laughs> giant container. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't. Um, I do have a ladle. <laughs> Just kidding. A nice big like yeah, yeah double, double soup ladle. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, bubble bubble the toil and trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's a it, it's just a funny concept because um, you know, once upon a time, uh yeah, we didn't have a means to you know, to, to just drop in the submersible pump. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of the submersible pumps that we had at that time were the maxi jets, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, nothing really much bigger than that. I mm-hmm. mean, we could utilize, uh, uh, let's see, some of the pond pumps and mm-hmm. stuff like that, but really no no powerful ones like the way that we have today. Yep. So a lot of the newer reefers have better equipment than we had before. And uh, yeah, once upon a time, I mean, we did have inconsistent uh, inconsistent mixing in salt. Yeah, no, definitely. It's a lot better now, but I know that definitely does happen once in a while. Uh, learning to reef said, I heard you shouldn't put a pump in right away because the reaction of salt with water could be bad for the pump. Um, I haven't heard that. I, personally, my pump never leaves the bucket, so I just turn it on and let it pre-mix up the water and just dump in salt as I go. I personally yep. haven't had an issue for it, but I don't know. Have you ever had anything issues that way? No, I usually... Well, a lot of people... <sighs> See, I've seen it uh, done a couple of different ways. Some people start off with salt and then they pour water in. Mm -hmm. That one creates a more caustic, a more caustic, uh, you know, salt mixture. Um, What I always do is I always fill up the water as high as I need to. And then, you know, once again, if I know that I'm going to be mixing up 200 gallons, I fill it up to the 200 gallons and I add the salt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, It's always better to add salt to the water. Um, Especially some of those like anhydrous, something like that, whatever. Anhydrous. Yeah, anhydrous. Yeah, because uh, what what ends up happening with some of the uh, anhydrous, uh, I want to call it the powders or the the mixture, is that it creates a lot of heat, mm-hmm. and pumps pumps and heat really don't go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. I mean it uh, it does raise the temperature of the water pretty pretty high. Calcium chloride. If you guys ever mixed the uh, the BRS stuff and you felt the the container, it's pretty hot. Yep. Hey, cheaper than using a heater to heat it up. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> bonus. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Now, okay. So here, here's another thing to consider. Um, mm-hmm. if you small tank versus big tank. Um, I know mm-hmm. like the whole apartment reefing's a lot more popular these days. So, mm-hmm. a lot of people have smaller tanks, and I honestly think small tanks are pretty darn easy to maintain. Is if you do mm-hmm. a weekly water change, like a one bucket water change, I mean your tanks yep. will be pretty darn stable. It's gonna yep. account for most things. Uh. Usually, if you're going acros and branching curls, you're still going to need a doser. So mm-hmm. I would still advise doing that way. If you're doing a softy tank, I mean, water change is all you need. Um, yep. Now, Well, what, yeah, one of the biggest things about uh, having a smaller tank is do you have sufficient nutrient removal? Because mm-hmm. a lot of the smaller skimmers, not so efficient. Um, the refugium areas are really, really small. It's not really geared up for, you know, like... I want to call it a, a higher maintenance type of corals or a setup. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen some that have, <laughs> I mean, um, you see in systems, you know, little nano systems, 30 gallons or less, and they have an apex, which costs, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars running oh, a very, very small tank. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. a, it, I mean, it seems like a little bit of overkill, you know, for kind of like what you're saying is if you're maintaining and you're doing water changes, you're doing water changes religiously, and you know exactly what salt, what salt mixture it is. You do, you know, pre-testing of the makeup water before you actually add it in. You're pretty much safe. Um, so, you know, all these systems, the sensors, you know, is it really necessary? I mean, in in, in my opinion, the ROI isn't quite there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the yield of how much coral that you have versus the amount of, um, I want to say, expensive fish mm-hmm. that you also have. I mean, the Yasha Gobi is uh, pretty expensive for the size, and you rarely see it in a large system. So I try to stay away from those smaller, the smaller fish in a large tank. Mm-hmm. Um, but Wait, why like do you say that? You... Just because you never see them? 
Oh, yeah, you, 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 okay. you hardly ever see them. Usually in the big, you know, in a big uh, three hundred gallon tank, and you have a lot of rock work. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they would typically, and you know, with my luck, they would always go in the back, the back of yeah. the rock structure, where That's I can't fair. even see them. You know, and then mm -hmm. I could hear the uh, the little clicking shrimp and everything else, and they're on the back side of the tank. So, mm -hmm. you know, is it really worth the the investment at that time? But in the nano system, you know, having the three sides, you know, very very close, the rock work all the way to the back, and you have, uh, I want to say, limited real estate for those uh, those fish. It's easier to see those. Um, the tinier organisms in those smaller tanks. That's actually one thing I appreciate with the nano. I like finding the micro life because yeah. you little sexy shrimp, little tiny Ooh. crabs, like little creatures, the more you look at, you just find yeah. more. But that part is fun. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. I did have a flaming prawn gobi once. I was like this big. It was so tiny. <laughs> and it was like, you'd see him like once every few weeks if you're lucky. Like he was so elusive, but super cool. So the, the tiny tanks are fun. And mm -hmm. I do find them really easy as long as, you know, yeah. stick to a regular water change and literally, per personally, I've not had an issue yeah. by doing that. Um, okay. Yep, absolutely. Regar regardless of the tank size, um, mm -hmm. automatic top off, important. Yep. That's one thing I 100% recommend. You know, yep. nano tank or big tank, regardless, yep. make sure your water stays stable, especially in the nano act. It's probably more important. Yep. Um, that yep, and absolutely. heater and heater controller. Two things. Do you need a controller? Yep. No, mm -hmm. but those two things I would invest in. So heater okay. failures. And uh, there's yes. actually a third. Yeah. But wait, there's more. Okay. <laughs> there's also a third in uh yes. <laughs> it's also oxygenation. In the smaller tank, you mm -hmm. don't get enough uh oxygen exchange. A lot of the times there's just not enough surface area for uh for the de uh for the degassing and a lot of the all in ones, they don't have enough um how do you say it? Surface they're, agitation. They're, they're pretty much enclosed. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Well correct. If correct. you have one with you know, a like lid, if you yes, have good air quality. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So I'm referring to the bio cubes, the JBJs, et cetera. Mm. Yep. So you need you need to have um, you know the skimmer plumbed out to fresh air. Mm -hmm. That's always a good one. Yep. Um, and make sure that you don't uh, you don't go cheap on the skimmer as well. Now, if you I've, don't, I've uh, run into so many people. Yeah, go ahead. Now, if you don't have a skimmer, oh, mm -hmm. just make yep. sure you point your power head at the surface more, or your mm -hmm. return pump little nozzle. Point it more at the surface because mm -hmm. all that surface agitation is going to promote gas exchange, which is very important. Yep, correct, correct. So, and just make sure that your CO two inside your house is less than six hundred. How Good is pressure. someone going to measure that? <laughs> oh, there's a. I, I noticed that the, there was a CO two quality meters on Amazon hmm. now. Really? You could buy them for about one hundred fifteen bucks. Uh, that's up there. Peace of mind. Most people aren't going to buy that. I'm curious though. I'm curious. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they bought the Apex for the. Uh, for the uh for the nano tank <laughs> well that's hardcore that being yeah, said i, I had the e-curl control on my nano so i can't talk uh <laughs> which is now my logo um nice yep but yeah surface agitation so, yeah. definitely important mm -hmm. yep so what i would do in the smaller tanks or any other tank is just always take a look at your alkalinity versus your ph mm -hmm. and make sure that you're you're in uh in line okay so explain this how does someone acceptable how does someone know they're in line well, typically, um, I would say at a typical alkalinity of around 8.2, you should be easily getting a pH of about 8.3, 8.4. Okay. At what alkalinity? 8.2? Yeah, uh, yeah 8.2, 8.0. You could go all the way down to 7.8 and still be able to hit the pH of 8.4, provided so, that gas exchange is good. So if you have a standard issue alkalinity, so... I'm going to just go say between 8 and 9, because that's a good range to be, because you're kind of in the middle of yep. the, the range. Mm -hmm. yep. Then you should be able to hit a pH of 8 or higher. That's a good way to yep. judge it? Yep, absolutely. If you're below that and you're having a hard time getting above the 8, mm -hmm. then you know you have some CO2 issues. Okay. Um, and at that point, make sure that you could run fresh air, a fresh air line to a skimmer. Mm -hmm. um, don't try to pump in, you know, don't try to utilize the indoor air as um, gas exchange at that point. Um, a good way to test this, if you haven't done it, open a window for the day and see how much your pH rises over normal. If you see a big boost, then you know your house is full of CO2. Um, old houses back in the day, not very well sealed. You had some pretty good inside-outside exchange. New houses are like bubble-wrapped and saran-wrapped yep. and everything else. So it maintains a lot more of that if you don't have good air recirculation or right. exchanger, I guess. So good way yep. to do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. So, um, let's see. Large tanks. Yep. Hmm. 
Okay. Yes, you have more fish, <laughs> whatever you want. Yeah, more fish. You have as many tanks. Yep, many tanks as, as, as you want. Yep. yep. Um, all that, all uh, that space. I, I personally prefer long tanks. I've seen like stubbier and tall. I, I think more fish room or lengthwise is to a lot more to work with. Yep. So, well, not only that, but uh, when when a lot of people go big, they also go deeper, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to also take into consideration that a lot of these smaller LEDs can't penetrate all the way through that light. You need more powerful lighting. You know, there's still the metal halos. You have the newer LEDs that actually are the cannons that could actually penetrate all the way through, but then your spread becomes limited. So when you're going with a deeper tank, you have to worry about what your par is, what kind of corals, what kind of livestock that you're going to actually contain, you know, in mm -hmm. that. Um, especially if you're not utilizing, like, say, a greenhouse, like the way that Than does or mm -hmm. the way that, uh, you know, some of these uh, public aquarium utilize, they utilize uh, solar tubes to actually get the light into those coral tanks as well. No, that's very true. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's another big thing. Uh, cost. Obviously, yep. a tiny tank is yep. going to be a lot cheaper, where mm -hmm. a bigger tank is going to be more expensive. I mean, again, your lighting is probably going to be your biggest aside from buying the tank is going to be your biggest thing is the lighting because you know leds aren't the cheapest these days especially if you want powerful ones to go for deeper yep. so yep. the deeper your tank is the more juice you need to penetrate down especially if you're going for like the you know the sps dominant tank um if you're doing lps or softies you're pretty flexible on what you can get away with for lighting correct and with the with the higher powered lighting you get a lot more heat generation as well so you have to think about mm -hmm. air exchange for yep. cooling the lighting systems, mm -hmm. because one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest enemies for lighting is heat. Yep. So if you don't get remove the heat out of the lighting, what ends mm -hmm. up happening is that the lifespan of your LED or your light fixture, uh, you know, shortens. Now that's a big thing if you have a canopy. If your if your light is mm -hmm. contained and not breathing mm -hmm. properly, if it's you know yep. rimless floating in the air, you're probably not as big of a deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Nasty Nemo had a good point, which I 100 percent agree with. Anything deeper than your armpit is a pain. So if you're deciding on tank depth, yep. you know, you take into account your stand in your tank and stand beside it, measure to your armpit and try and keep it less than that because then you can actually get in and reach stuff. If it's higher than your armpit, then you're tippy-toeing and standing on stuff and it's a pain to do stuff. So yep. the more effort it is, the less you're going to do it. So anything you can do right. to make life easier it means your tank's going to be happier. Yeah. Now, absolutely. the other aspect is a nano is easy to maintain. You know, one mm -hmm. bucket water change, simple. I could do it in like four minutes. It's like Super duper easy. If you want to speed up your water changes, get a bigger hose so you can suck your water out way faster, right? Like a one inch hose will fill a five yep. gallon bucket in like 30 seconds. So, yep. right, it can go a lot quicker. So, you can make your life really easy by doing these little things to speed it up, which means you can do it more. Now, if your tank yep. is too big and it, it, it also means more work to an extent, you know, bigger tanks mm -hmm. can be more stable, but if you're doing a water change or something, then mm -hmm. it does take more time, it does take more effort. So you also need to make sure it fits your lifestyle, right? Correct. So that's another thing Correct. to consider. Yep. yep. And I mean, I've seen some really, really nice big tanks, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they run into the dinoflagellates issue. You know, it's mm -hmm. one of the, you know, one of those, uh, I want to call it uh, nuisances that uh, would cause somebody to tear down their tank. The larger the system and, you know, if you have those kind of issues like dinoflagellates, flatworm, et cetera, et cetera, the mm -hmm. remediation is a lot more expensive as well. Yep. No, very, very true. And, yep. And, and, uh, and not only that, but also in uh, some of the bigger tanks, you know, like uh, trying to move in with uh, uh, or remove certain pest pest species with a net or, mm -hmm. you know, once again, if it's, uh, if it's deeper than your armpit, you can't reach them. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's very, very hard to. Exactly. Um, so, uh, a minute ago, someone commented on this, I just want to touch on it. They said, uh, something, something about deodorant is not good for your chemistry. hundred percent agree. So on that note, you don't want your armpit in yep. the tank, putting your deodorant all in the tank bad. So any contaminants in the tank mm -hmm. is not good for the tank. Um, especially if you have, you know, deodorant, obviously moisturizers, soaps, you know, if you're working on a core, oils, greases, all that stuff is bad. It's always a good idea to rinse your hands before you put them in the tank. Um, I tend to not use soap because I think you're just putting soap in the tank, so I usually just rinse. But always a good idea before you start diving in your tank to do maintenance. And the less you put your hands in, the better. Some people use gloves. Yeah. Personally, I don't because I find them a pain in the butt. So I just rinse my hands off or try to. Yep. Yeah. 
I use RO to rinse off, takes off all the oils too. Oh, good to know. RO sucks off everything. Really? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Good to know. It's, like, it's one of the best solvents in the world. <laughs> huh. So, yeah, I mean, also in the bigger system, like say you want coral colonies and you want to be able to see them, inspect them, mm -hmm. a larger tank makes it a little bit harder to actually see in between the nooks and crannies so and so forth. You can't really inspect it. Mm -hmm. um, in a larger system, you're using bigger rock mm -hmm. or bigger rock work. Um, you know, it's very, very heavy. Um, moving, you know, if you're if you're not in a house, you know, that, that belongs to you, moving becomes an issue with the larger tanks. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, Just getting my yeah. new tank up the stairs took like five of us. That was a heavy, heavy bugger. Three-quarter inch glass uh, by six feet tank. Absolutely. Ooh, it's heavy. Sitting in my living room, I still need to get people over to put on the stand yeah. next. So, mo moving is definitely an issue if your tank is too big. Um, I was talking to someone the other day, yeah. and they were like, nope, I won't buy a tank mm -hmm. that's too, too big for me to move by myself. I was like, all right, there you go. But yeah. mm -hmm. And that's that's one of the, I want to say, um, and this is a side note, um, basically that's, uh, that's one of the appeals of acrylic tanks, is mm -hmm. that they're lighter. Yes. You could actually go with a bigger volume. There's more flex. You don't have to worry about glass breaking. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, th that's uh, one of the benefits of actually going acrylic. And then once again, the downside of acrylic is that it scratches very, very easily. And then I, you have that Euro brace all the way around, which makes yeah. a hole that big to get in, <laughs> you know, to get in your tank. Yes. No, so, I I have never went acrylic. I lie. I had an acrylic jellyfish tank, but I've never done it for a fish tank or reef tank because mm -hmm. yep. I I'm OCD about scratches and drive me nuts. Can do it. Well, I've uh, I've scratched some. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, with the uh, with the algae scraper and stuff like that, and I picked up some sand. Mm -hmm. Don't know how it got there, um, but <laughs> yeah, I went in, and you could actually polish it out. But if you get a, uh, I want to say, if you get a scratch on the glass tank, you can't. Yep. So once again, plus and minuses. Acrylic, you could repair. Mm -hmm. Glass, you can't. You can't. Yep. No, it's so, true. Well, it's not worth it. Yeah. But yeah, that's true. So, but it's less likely. Right? Yes. Okay. T typically. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the newer float glass, um, you know, the low iron glass, they scratch a lot easier. They're very, very soft. I hear that. But so far, so good. My last couple tanks have been low iron, and I haven't had any scratches. You're, yeah. You're lucky. <laughs> now, here yeah. is a, a pro tip. Because I, I like yeah. the Starfire. I like the low iron. Um, yeah. On the tank, I can't reach it. But uh, the flipper cleaner, hands down one of my favorites, because it's super thin, good magnet. Now, yeah. I... They'll probably kill me for saying this because they want you to use both sides. I only <coughs> use the razor blade because you have the strip of razor and two little nubs, which is not a lot of surface area for stuff to scratch. And usually something scratching is either one, you have a rusty blade, or two, you have you capture sand or something between the magnets and the glass. That's what scratches. But when you only have that tiny slit of the razor blade and the two nubs, there's very hard to scratch stuff. So I only use the razor blade and I've never scratched that way. So good way to go. Mm -hmm. I also utilize the uh uh, what is it called? Yeah. The Velcro, the Velcro, the hook part to actually mm -hmm. do a lot of the scrubbing as well. Yeah. Even on the glass tanks. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are, they're like looking at me with the little teeny tiny uh, um, Velcro uh, scrubber. And I'm like cleaning the entire freaking glass with it. Because <laughs> I also have OCD, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, oh. you know, yep. I need to get around and uh, really, really hit the, a lot of the corners and the edges. And it's funny. Yep. They just watch me. Uh, that's funny okay pure fish girl it's hard for us short people to get that first under on our armpits uh the tank would only be 12 inches deep for me the new tank is 20 inches high off the dive in there i was just laughing i said take a shower first but yeah yeah okay um one of the tanks i filmed yeah. the other day brandon's tank it was it's yeah. like 600 gallons and he like reaches it from a walk board like he probably has to go in there to freaking in his shorts to do stuff which is crazy yeah. but yeah make sure you're not all like lathered up in sunscreen or body lotion or moisturizer or whatever the heck it is before you go in there so you just want to avoid any type of contaminants getting into your tank especially on a small tank right because that could be more impactful yeah. on that tiny volume of water correct correct yeah uh nasty you know same here so I don't also with the larger tanks and the larger <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the um, you know with the larger tanks you have larger rocks. Just be very very careful when you're setting them down. Make sure that mm -hmm. you have enough. Um, I want to say padding 
on the inside where the rock actually hits the glass. Because mm-hmm. I've seen a number of catastrophes where they're utilizing mm-hmm. these big boulders, right? The live rock or the petrified rock. Mm-hmm. And they put them in with no no padding on, on the pressure points. And what ends up happening is that they crack the bottom. Mm-hmm. So Oof. make sure that... Uh, Make sure that you have uh, precautions in places that, you know, with the heavier rock and heavier structures. Yeah, if you do on those, mm-hmm. good point. Um, yeah. I glue the main pieces on mine, like little pieces I won't worry about, but like the main core mm-hmm. pieces I tend to glue right. or mm-hmm. cement or whatever, just so there's not a risk of it falling over and smack in the side of the tank because mm-hmm. bad things yep. can happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How mm-hmm. do you uh, how do you attach uh, the bottom, the bottom uh, of the uh, the rock? Like, I how just do you refloat it. Um, I'll really? either use a flat piece like the new tank. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. a, a chunk of them I use the Marco base rock, which is one side cut cut flat. In the past, mm-hmm. I use a hacksaw and literally just cut a foot on the piece of rock. Yep. Or if it's one that has little bumps, I'll take a hammer and just smack it and kind of smooth it out so it's fairly yep. s- soft on the bottom. Yeah, um, and the weight is spread out over a larger. Yeah. And yeah, the, the other thing I've done is used a bit of like reef putty or cement to make a foot for it to kind of like spread it out and give it a little base yep. on the bottom. So, yep. uh, there you go. Not before too. Nick says rub it on concrete. Yeah, like anything you can do to smooth it out <laughs> makes it better, right? Hi, cuz. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people forget about that. You know, they're really, really excited. They're starting to put rock in and then they forget that all the rock uh, all the rocks, uh, I want to call it accumulated weight, push on those little sharp points. Mm-hmm. And those little sharp points could actually break the glass as well. So, yeah. However you're going to flatten the bottom, the base mm-hmm. rock, flatten out the base rock. Exactly. Uh, Reefer on the Fringe is asking, do you balance your parameters as far as elk, calcium, and mag? I don't, like, if you're talking about new salt and water changes, I never adjust it, but I also don't do big water changes. I guess I technically do on the nano tank. But I usually just do little ones. So I, I just test my tank weekly. Uh, my elk is daily with the Alcatronic. Um, the rest of the parameters I just test weekly. And I just make sure that they're stable on a weekly basis. And if they are off, then I'll just, you know, my dose are up or down to tweak it to make sure it's pretty stable. Yep. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Drink comments. Uh, what else are we going to say? Yeah, what else? Okay, so little tanks, big advantage, mm-hmm. something goes wrong, really yep. easy to do a water change and fix it if something's out of whack. Yep. Big tank, not so easy. You know, you need to have a mass, yep. a big container to do your water volume. So I think little tanks are easy in one respect. Mm-hmm. A lot of people always say, so, go go big, you know, you'll be safer. Yep. I kind of think it's cheaper and easier to do a little tank and when mm-hmm. water change is going to be easy. Good way to get your feet wet. Absolutely. And you get to see your uh, your coral, your little frags grow a lot. You know, mm-hmm. a lot more, and you can appreciate it more in a in a smaller tank than you do in a larger tank. Um, you know, kind of like uh, what my cousin uh, Nick and I were talking about the other day is, you know, reef within your means. Mm-hmm. If you know that you're, you know, how do you say it? If you know that you're going to be strapped for cash, you know, in the hobby, never go reef poor. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Never reef outside your means. Mm-hmm. Well, it's because true. then when things go wrong, you don't have any, any, any recourse to, to rectify it. Mm-hmm. You know, people have no test kits. I've seen that happen. And, you know, you're like, well, what are your parameters? Well, they're fine. Okay. Well, you didn't test. <laughs> so how do you, how do you know they're fine? You know, mm-hmm. and you know, they don't have the, the right equipment. They don't have the right salt. They don't have, um, yeah, they don't have a lot of, uh, I want to call it amendments. Do you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying, Dev? Yep. And you know, the larger the system that you go, Sometimes it's a little bit outside of your mean save up, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, do a little bit of homework, you know, run a smaller tank, you know, get your hands wet first, yep. you know, kind of like what Dove said is if you have a small investment, it's a small investment. If you, mm-hmm. you know, start off with a, you know, 300, 400 gallon tank and it's your first time and it's your first tank, mm-hmm. boy, you're in for a world of hurt, you know? So definitely reef within your means. I think uh, a lot of people get uh, bug eyed with, you know, the glamour and everything else, you know, Dev makes it looks, uh, he makes it look very, very easy to reef, <laughs> you know, no problems, a hundred percent time, you know, oh, perfect there's water problems. parameters, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> you know, perfect water parameters. Mm-hmm. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Yep. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. Welcome back. Mike, quick shout out. Facebook. 
Probably. Sorry. Mike, thanks for the two dollars super chat. It says bought both tanks to use, save both money, but both tanks cracked. Yikes. Okay. Tanks crack sucks. Um buying used, great way to get into the hobby because it can save you a lot of money to get in fairly cheap. Now right. I've I had a tank crack once. It and it sucks. Like not a fun experience, so I feel free on that one. Yep. Yep. Um, so Derek was asking tricks to maintain pH in a nano. Mm. Go first. Okay. I like to balance, uh, to make sure that my carbonates and my bicarbonates are balanced. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the times, um, you know, people keep on adding in soda ash, soda ash, soda ash, mm -hmm. which is, uh, sodium carbonates, right? Mm -hmm. And then they forget that the flip side to the carbonate balance is the bicarbonates. So mm -hmm. sometimes some of these mixes aren't uh, aren't quite blended c together. So yeah, it's uh, something that you would actually take a look at. And make sure that your pH and your um, your alkalinity, if you know all aeration is good and oxygen mm -hmm. exchange is good, that if the pH can't make it up, that maybe you might have a bicarbonate issue. Mm -hmm. And then the only way that you could actually balance that is with al uh, uh, yeah. Basically, the two-part balling, or you know, the carbonates, bicarbonates, and then also the borate salts. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's a little bit more into the chemistry, but um, at that point, I'd like to, you know, kind of like what Dev was saying before. If you're in a small tank, it's easy to just do a water change, and then you mm -hmm. don't have to worry about that because the salt typically is balanced. Um, in a larger system, you have to learn a little bit more chemistry because you can't do those water changes that easily. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you start taking a look at your bicarbonate level, your boron levels, and also your uh, your boron effects pH levels, and you start balancing out boron effects yep, boric pH. Boric acid. Hmm. Did not know that. Mm -hmm. It's what they so. call borates. Yeah, borate salts. Nice. Um, yeah. So, and then CO two also plays in because it also produces uh, car uh, carboxylic acid, which also flips the uh, HCO three or H two CO three. Mm -hmm. in, uh, I want to call it a weak acid, weak base buffer. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, you know, I know that a lot of people don't uh, don't want to hear the uh, the full chemistry lesson behind it, but, yeah, it, it does affect um, their total buffering capacity. So mm -hmm. just be, be aware that if your alkalinity is way up here, sky high, and your pH is way down here, check your aeration and then check your, your buffering capacity of your water. Okay, no, there you go, perfect tip. Uh, Mike Horan, uh, both are 32 gallon bile cubes. Uh, I feel like the curved glass design is flawed. Ah, yes. Um, I got a 40 gallon innovative marine, also used amazing price bundle. What can I do to keep this one intact? Um, is your tank curved glass? So usually, first of all, thank you for $5 super chat. Um, secondly, on the curved glass so usually what happens is when the manufacturer bends the glass if they glue it and cure it and it's not fully like 90 degrees there's a bit of stress pulling on that seam of the glass yep. and eventually it can crack um some have theorized it could be because power heads and other stuff just vibrating on the glass could potentially do it so if you do have a power on the side maybe put it on the back wall of your tank not on the side wall that could reduce a little bit of stress on it but mm -hmm. aside from that i mean you just it's a bit of the luck in the waiting game. It really depends how the glass was bent. I mean, thicker glass is obviously safer. Thinner glass is more of a risk. But yeah, mm -hmm. any type of vibration. So power head, put it on the back wall instead of the side wall is probably the biggest thing you can do to help prevent it. Correct. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you also have to choose your power head correctly too. Yeah. Um, okay, so a reefer on the fringe. What's your calcium and elk? So... 8.03 is the current elk. I I try and keep it. I like around 8.3 ish, 8.5. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was creeping up, so I lowered my dosing, so it's been slowly dropping. So now I might just up it a teeny smidge. But um, that's been yeah. So I usually keep it in there. Eight to eight and a half is a happy range. Calcium. Yeah. I honestly haven't tested calcium in a long so, time. Gotcha. Well, my ranges. I just uh, tested it a little while ago. Mm -hmm. um, our calcium's uh, roughly between 400. 410. Mm -hmm. um, alkalinity, once again, pretty pretty much spot on with yours. It's anywhere between 8.1 and 8.4. You know, that's where my sweet spot is. And then my magnesium is roughly around 14, 1440. Okay. Um, okay. And, and potassium is roughly around 390 to about 410. Okay. Perfect. Potassium. I rarely test that. That's a lot of work to test that one. 
It's a very slow test, nah, case, if I recall. It's not not, not bad. <laughs> I ha I have. I mean, while I'm doing all the other tests, while I'm doing all the other tests, that one's sitting. Yeah, I I have been extremely lazy since I've got all these auto testers now. I love it. So I I slack on testing now because I got these automations that test like daily and weekly now. I'm Hard still to go so back. old school. I am old school on testing. Did you see? Oh, it's not in here. My my, my newest toy. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I just posted it on Instagram for the stream, but I got a Dosetronic, so I'm stoked. So it can dose everything nice. and adjust your levels based on what the elk is. So if it consumes more Sweet. elk, it can up all your other levels and all that stuff and keep it in balance, which is cool. Wow. Yeah, I'm excited. That could just... be dangerous, though. <laughs> Maybe. So I'm still debating if I put it on the Lagoon Tank, which is 100% dosing, or if mm -hmm. I put it on the Big Reef and use the Calcium Reactor for like 80% of the dosing, and then mm -hmm. use the Auto Talents or let it tweak on top of it. That way it's really cheap. In the yeah. dosing stuff, I don't know. I'm still, still on the fence of which tank these are on, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us know. Let us know in the next stream. What you I will. Decide. I will. Uh, okay, a couple comments. What I missed. Uh, so, okay, so reefers do it deeper. Um, he was asking about moving a tank sideways and if it would be too much stress in the glass. Mm -hmm. He just verifies three quarter inch glass, so you're probably pretty safe there because that's pretty thick glass. Mm -hmm. Depends on the size of the tank, yeah. but I think you're fairly safe on that one. Three quarters tough. Yeah, it is. Uh, so t t Tom Reeferman was saying that he gets boron from Walmart. What, what what is the general use of boron? Like, what is the common? Um, typically it's a uh, it, it's the unspoken balance. It, it's kind of like magnesium to alkalinity and calcium. I was mm -hmm. like the fulcrum of that little yep. little seesaw. Boron mm -hmm. also does the same with the carbonates and the bicarbonates. And yep. kind of balances them out. Okay. So you have to have a good, good. Uh, I want to call it a center point for the uh, for the bicarbonates and carbonates to balance against. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Uh, David Jones, is anyone familiar? Are two XF three fifties too much for a three foot tank? I believe that's XF. That sounds like the Max Specs Gyre. I'm gonna say that's a lot of flow on a three foot tank. I think the three fifties are the big one. If correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's a lot on a three foot tank. Correct, no. and you have to worry about your uh, your pulsing and your harmonics, especially you know, with a lot of the glass tanks with the silicone seam. If the mm -hmm. silicone has been damaged or compromised in any way, you know, with like uh, say a glass scraper or a razor blade, you know, just the oscillation of the waves going back and forth mm -hmm. could tear apart the, uh, the silicone seams. I've seen That's that true. happen a couple yeah. of times. So if you got a nice big standing wave sloshing back and forth, that is pressure hitting each side of the wall of your tank. Yep, yeah, so, it goes like this. Yep, so thicker glass, obviously stronger. Thinner glass, potentially more of an issue on it. Um, and right. part of the glass thickness, not just the glass, but it also accounts for how much silicone bonding there is, right? So thin glass is like that much silicone, you know, thick glass is that much silicone. So that kind of plays into it to an extent as well. Yep. And it's also a, uh, a good uh, uh, vibration dampener too. Mm -hmm. So the more silicone. Yep. Yep. Okay, so reef... Reefer on the fringe was saying it's for pH stability, but can inhibit your corals from taking calcium alkalinity if it's too high. That was about the boron. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's all new to me. Good to know. Thanks yep. for the tips. That's exactly. Yep. I don't want to get too much into it, but yeah, he yep. hit it on the head. Mm -hmm. Very good. Awesome. Love it. Uh, Nick, I like a five gallon and manage it with small frequent water changes. Makes sense. A cup of water every time you walk by. It could be super stable. Yep. Good. A couple of water here. Couple yep. water in. Yep. Exactly. Uh, do do do. Silicone should act as a shock absorber, somewhat, but it somewhat. also stresses if you're beating up too much. Correct. Right off. But thicker glass, thicker silicone, the less issues you have to worry about. Yep, correct. Uh, the bigger the better. I'm switching from two MP40s. Normally just do the random modes and not the wave modes. Yeah, I like Reef Crest too. I use that one quite a bit. I do that or alternate between pulsing once in a while, but. I, honestly, I just like to mix it up because your corals don't want to be hit the same way all day, so just variety is a good thing. Yep. <laughs> Jeremy, Devin, with all your tanks, you might as well set up a coral tank and propagate your corals to fill the other tanks. Ah, one day. One day. Like, for, for your space. I would love to have a big, like, four foot by eight foot just, like, grow table. That'd be sweet. Yep. One day. All right, reef on the fringe. See you later. Uh... Pretty much every marine pH buffer products being sold is borax or boron. Huh. I thought it was, I always thought it was more just like an alkalinity, like a baking soda type of thing they add in there to boost it up via elk. 
uh, it increases the stability of uh, of the alkalinity. Okay, nice, good to know. Um, okay, any other big things? Pros, cons, big small. What do you Ooh, anything else? Let's off see. Your head? Oh yeah, filtration, filtration. Yeah. Bigger, bigger system, bigger filtration. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bigger fish load, more yep. filtration needed. Um, yeah, which means a bigger sump, refugium, bigger mechanics, bigger skimmer. <laughs> and then at, the, at, at that point, the, the price starts going this way, and it's more than yep. your house. <laughs> um, one tip I will give, if you stick to mod modular style LEDs, if you're going the LED route, Mm -hmm. um if you get ones that are modular like the puck design as you go bigger yep. you can just keep adding on to it i do think that's one good thing to keep in consideration yep. um like i had like i started out with like the cheap china lights on my nanos then eventually ended up splurging on two xr15s which was a fortune for me back in the day but i got two for my 30 gallon because it's three feet long and i just kept buying more as my tanks got bigger so it made upgrading cheaper in a sense because i didn't have to buy replace it i just added on to it so, so it's another thing to consider like auto top offs there's a lot of stuff that you can reuse and scale with you so keep that in yep. mind if you think you're the type of person that's going to upgrade or scale up as yep. time goes on yep absolutely and sometimes having um you know kind of like what uh, dev was saying the more modular systems like say you have a you know 300 400 gallon system but you have like i want to say a skimmer that was sized for 150 by another mm -hmm. 151 you know what I'm saying? Now you have two skimmers. You don't have yep. to depend on just one big one. And I think that that's where a lot of people make a mistake. They just go big. You know, mm -hmm. they go big on their calcium reactor. They go big on their on their skimmers, and they only have one of them mm -hmm. instead of having two or three smaller ones. That, yep. You know, that are easier to maintain, easier to lift. Um, you know, if one goes down, no problem. You still got two more. You know, mm -hmm. um, as a backup and. Um, yeah, the redundant, uh, I want to call it redundant uh, design in your system. I would rather have two or three skimmers than mm -hmm. one big one that fails. So if one dies, you get your backup. Yeah. The yeah. same thing with then, heaters, and, right? And, and not yeah. only that, but it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. Because as you scale up, it doesn't get cheaper, you know, mm -hmm. per volume. Sure. It's more expensive. Um, and then, you know, getting the off-the-shelf, uh, you know, ready, ready skimmers, you don't have to wait, mm -hmm. you know, delivery time. You don't have a super big pump that you have to wait, you know, with mm -hmm. a 16 week lead time, uh, you know, you, you just grab it off the shelf out of a, you know, I want to say a, an LFS and be able to replace it right then and there. Yep. So readily available, uh, replacements. That's also, you know, another key, if you're actually going to go big, you know, start looking at modular, uh, modular filtration systems, so on and so forth, instead mm -hmm. of one big one. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people pay a little bit too much on, uh, super super large systems one mm -hmm. one return pump i mean yeah. i get it it's cleaner it looks looks nicer but when Dual things pumps start redundant. failing oh absolutely and mm -hmm. you can pump it on both sides yeah you know and you have different flow different flow um, um yeah uh chaotic flow random flow whatever mm -hmm. um so yeah sometimes having two smaller ones is a lot more powerful and a lot more versatile than having just one yep. big one and redundant if one dies your system's not going to miss a beat Will still work. Mm -hmm. so, redundancy is good. Do we do? Yep. Okay. Um, quick heads up. I think I'm going to cut her off in about five minutes because it's okay. freezing out and I have to pick my wife up. And I know you have to <laughs> okay. hang out with your kids and help them yep. with some homework and other stuff tonight. So. Yes. 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 Yep. So. That's going to be fun. Yeah. We're at about 15 minutes. So yeah, I'll give her about five more minutes and we'll shut her down. So if you got okay. any last minute questions in the chat, make sure you ask them. Um, yep. Yeah. So it's good. I like your background, Chris. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. This is my son's room. Yeah. Good yeah. spot. I, I appreciate his aquatic I'm theme. hiding. I'm hiding from him. You're, wait, wait. <laughs> hiding you're from hiding him. from him in his room. Yes. Where he'll never yes. find you. <laughs> well, this is his playroom. He has his uh, bedroom upstairs, and he's like on Minecraft, on a Minecraft kick right now. Nice. It's funny. Wait until yeah. you have kids. They'll, they'll be doing stuff that, <laughs> that has yeah. nothing to do with what we like. That's, that's yeah. true. I will have pseudo kids soon. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, we're hosting a couple. Like, we're, we're hosting a couple exchange students, so Ooh, I'm nice. gonna be like no kids to teenagers. Like, so. <laughs> one awesome. of them was already checking out my YouTube channel and like the reef tanks and stuff, so they're all excited for it. So maybe cool. maybe I'll create a new reefer. It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, awesome. exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, tank addicts, how do you feel about canisters on a nano? 
Um, it can work. Um, oh yes, a while ago someone asked about how to about hang on filters as well. So sure. you you do not need a saltwater tank. You can absolutely run a tank with hang on filters. In fact, I got a regular tank on the floor behind me as a temporary tank. Yeah, mm -hmm. as a temporary tank, and it just has an aqua clear with some carbon on the back and a power head and a gear. Yeah. So you you can do it. Um, same thing. You can use a canister filter if you want to run your carbon or your biomedia. Some people say they're nitrate factories because they can trap stuff in it. Just make sure you maintain it. Um, yep. Most people use them temporarily just for maintenance purposes. You could use it as your flow and you know could fill it full of live rock. Make sure yes. you clean it out once in a while. Aside from that, it works. Um, I prefer an all-in-one tank on a small tank, mainly just because I can hide my heaters and all my equipment. And yep. at the end of the day, it's aesthetics, right? Either way, it will yep. work. It just looks prettier if it's all hidden. Correct. So. Yeah, in our QT tanks, we also have hang on the back uh, filtration. We also utilize some canisters as well. Yep. So. Um, okay, so fishy business thoughts on a 120 four by two by two. So that's ideal, yeah. It's, it's, it's a good size, <laughs> personally. I like them. I would go for a six foot 120, that's a little shallower and longer, but that's my personal preference. Mm -hmm. At the end yeah. of the day, is what fits your space. If you have a nice four foot spot in your room, go for that. If you have a six foot spot, go for that. It's whatever fits your space and like looks good yep. in your life. That's kind of what I would always say. Um, and make sure it's a size that's reasonable for you to maintain. Like we kind of touched on that earlier. Make sure something yep. that, you know, it's not too expensive to maintain. You can keep up with it. So it's kind of what fits your life. And that goes a long way yep. in maintaining the tank and the tank being successful by you giving the attention that it is. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, do, 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 do. Uh, N-Doc organics are in the red. Any tips to reduce without water changes? Increase your output, so be it a refugium. If you have a refugium, yep. maybe upgrade to a, a little more of an intense light so that yep. your chato grows faster or your algae scrubber, whatever it is, can export a bit more. Um, if, yep. you have, if you already have one, you can also increase the duration that the light's on. Yep. Um, aside from that, if it's phosphates, you can use like GFO or lantern chloride or Aurora Fos, yep. what need those to help do that for nitrates? Yep. Again, it's kind of well, LG. Or... Mm -hmm. Go, Chris. <laughs> and then there's also the bubbling. You know, you utilize a, a lot of people utilize bacteria now, and mm -hmm. you know, there's been a trend to actually utilize the bacteria as a nutrient export as well. Yep. So the bubbling encourages the aerobic bacteria, the autotrophic bacteria, to actually you know, consume a lot of the nitrates and the phosphates in a natural balance, yep. um, you know, in the red field ratio. And the, um, the funny thing is that as you're exporting it, you're noticing that uh, your nitrates and your phosphates mm -hmm. reduce. So moderate, uh, moderate vodka dosing or carbon dosing, uh, yep. you know, people utilize vinegar and or vodka or a mixture of both or some nopox. Um, you know, you could actually export a lot of uh, bacteria and that's what yep. the protein skimmer is doing is ex it's exporting the bacteria that's in the water column mm -hmm. and removing it. So that's a nutrient export uh, mechanism. Yep. So yep. Um, quick, quick, quick and dirty rundown. So yep. the other method is using denitrifying or nitrifying bacteria to mm -hmm. heat up these organics. You're dosing carbon dosing to feed that bacteria. So you add the bacteria, you add a little bit of a carbon source, which could be vinegar or vodka. Um, and that's going to help reduce it. Then on top of that, with the bubbling, you're adding extra oxygenation because as that bacteria colony grows, it's going to suck the oxygen out of your water. And then you're adding it back in via bubbling or whatever method to add it back in to keep your tank healthy. So that is definitely another way to do it. Yep, absolutely. What's up, little guy? <laughs> Want to say hi, Max? Say hi. I don't want to. Hi. <laughs> I like your clownfish. It's very you. nice. <laughs> What's his name? Max. Max. Hi, Max. <laughs> okay. Hi. Okay. All right, guys. Okay, I think I call it for today. I go pick up the wife because right. it's freaking freezing cold snap this week. Cruz, you gotta help your son. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yep, absolutely. For Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. If you enjoyed it, as always, hit that thumbs up button. If you're new, make sure you subscribe. Right. I'll catch you guys next week's video. Okay, thanks, guys. Okay.